Hi everyone, and welcome to the May 2022 Audio Engineering Society Toronto Section event. My name is Ross Whitney. I'm the chair of the AES Toronto Section, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's double feature. Our theme for the first part of the evening is how I turned my love of audio into a career. We'll open with presentations from two longtime members of the Toronto section, Blair Francie and Denis Tremblay. Blair and Denis have joined forces to form Norfolk and Jarvis Audio Technologies. Their slogan will give you an idea of what to expect, serious with a bit of mischief. Next, I'll sit down for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Arthur Kelm. Art's resume is longer than both of my arms, and he has some amazing and interesting stories to share. You won't want to miss our chat. Headlining this evening's event is a longtime friend and guru of our section, Professor John Vanderkoy. John will talk about his work on coupling capacitors in the audio recording and playback chains and the low frequency phase distortion they can produce. John has a true gift for taking a complicated subject and breaking it down into simple, understandable bites. So sit back, relax, enjoy our presentation, and say hello to our first presenters, Blair Francie and Denis Tremblay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Blair Francie. I want to thank the AES Toronto section for inviting me to participate in this monthly meeting and to share with you how my love of music became a career in audio. My love of music started when I was a child. My parents always had the radio on. I always loved music. When I was seven, my parents agreed to uh, pay for drum lessons, which I took at the Armitage uh, School of Music in Scarborough. It was short-lived because I had a short attention span and I didn't want to spend a lot of time practicing. My love for music uh, developed in public school. Uh, I loved singing. In grade seven, I was selected to, as one of three people and the only male student to represent Vradenburg Public School uh, in the All Scarborough Choir, which was great because I got like an afternoon off school and got to hang out mostly with girls. So that really uh, 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 propelled my love for music. When I was 15, I continued uh, by, I started buying singles actually, probably when I was about 13 at a local shop in Wishing Well Plaza. And when I turned 15, my dad introduced me to one of his recent hires at his work, a uh, young uh, gentleman named Greg Godovitz, who was uh, a musician, who was working for my dad to save money to buy his first professional quality bass guitar and bass amplifier so that he could go on the road with uh, the Canadian rock band Flood, uh, with whom he was bassist and vocalist. Shout out to Greg. I took guitar lessons from Greg and my dad agreed to buy me an AGS uh, Stratocaster copy and a a uh, cheap solid state uh, guitar amplifier that sounded like that. Uh, I always worked part time. I ended up uh, buying an acoustic guitar and I ended up buying a uh, Roberts uh, open reel uh, tape recorder. Uh, so um, during high school, I started to learn um, songs uh, written by Neil Young and James Taylor and the Beatles and Cat Stevens and 
the Eagles and uh, America and a whole host of bands. Uh, and I also uh, loved progressive rock. So English bands like Yes, Genesis, uh, European bands like PFM, uh, Triumvirate, Deep Purple, etc., etc. I finished high school and uh, went to university and uh, not long after I arrived in residence at uh, the University of Western Ontario, now known as Western University in 1975, uh, out came the acoustic guitars and uh, I joined a band with uh, uh, four other gentlemen with whom today I remain friends. Shout out to uh, Mike Capitasto, Mike Mitchell, Barry Mombriquette and Chuck McMillan. We still get together and play and have fun making music together. Uh, we've been playing music together for so long that we're all retired. Or less retired, we just were able to give up the day jobs working for somebody else. At any rate, um, through university, I continued to, uh, to play guitar. Uh, my love for music uh, got ramped up a few notches when Dire Straits' first album came out because I listened to that and thought, damn, I got to learn how to play guitar like that. And so I continued playing guitar, finished university, and I got a job uh, working for Electrosonic. So I started uh, working in a music-related business, selling... Uh, audio components, audio connectors, uh, electronics components. Um, did some side jobs with the warehouse manager at Electrosonic, Bill Orr, the late Bill Orr. Bless him, what a great guy. So, for example, uh, we did some wiring in the uh, new mastering studio at Quality Records on Birchmount. Uh, road in Scarborough. I also uh, was the guy who got up on the scaffolding and wired a 70 volt uh, speaker system for the new speaker system in the uh, main triple gym at Seneca College. And uh, as a result to my exposure, as a result of my exposure to electronics uh, uh, at Electrosonic, I built my first distortion pedal. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't work quite right the first round, uh, but I got the uh, ground, the lousy soldering job, uh, cold solder joints, etc., uh, fixed, and it worked. And then um, I got married, 1980. Uh, my wife couldn't find employment in Ontario as a social worker with a BA, so we moved to Western Canada, specifically Medicine Hat, Alberta. Uh, by that time, I had bought a, a Telecaster when I worked at Electrosonic. I sold that to finance the move out west. I did take my Hagstrom. I had a Hagstrom uh, electric guitar that I took with me, and I got out there and had my uh, stereo. Um, I bought a stereo in my first year uh, of university from my cousin Paul Francie. Thank you, Paul. Uh, he gave me an awesome deal um, because he had a, a shop on Young Street in North Toronto called the Consumer Stereo Warehouse. So he gave me a smoking deal on an iKai integrated amplifier, a Thorin's turntable, and a pair of acoustic research speakers. So I started buying all kinds of vinyl. Um, and could actually hear a real stereo image on this sound system, which ramped up my love for music even more. So when I moved to Western Canada, I got a job with a chartered bank, and I stuck that out for 15 months and realized that banking wasn't for me, so I quit. And I had also started playing in a weekend band, in Medicine Hat um, called Night Work uh, with um, Chris Moser and uh, Ed Doring on drums and uh, Bob McNabb on lead vocals and rhythm. So uh, we played in and around Medicine Hat. 
Got myself a Jazz Chorus 120. Um, got myself a Jazz Master. And uh, when I quit the bank, I decided I was going to become a bar musician. So uh, I formed a trio with Chris Moser. Uh, and a bunch of different drummers, and we played uh, B bars, uh, B rooms uh, in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia. Back when, if you were a bar musician, you played six gigs a week because you played a Saturday matinee, and you could actually pay the bills and uh, buy new gear with what you made uh, on those wages. So I did that until 1985, at which point in time we moved back to Ontario. I got involved with my family business and uh, we started a family. So uh, I got out of the uh, audio business because I was working in a family floor covering business because that paid the bills better. Uh, which I did until the early 90s. Uh, my love for music uh, uh, drew me back into playing. I joined a uh, new country cover band playing on weekends in 1996 and then 97. Uh, I was working full time and doing 100 bar dates a year uh, all over southern Ontario. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, took a toll on my health and uh, my marriage failed and uh, at that point, I decided that I was going to do what I wanted to do. So I got back into the music business full time, started playing bars, did some contract work during the day, uh, started uh, spending my beer budget on PA gear, started doing live sound for people and a bit of live recording, uh, bought my own Pro Tool setup, uh, put together my first uh, real home studio. Uh, did that till um, we closed our family business in 2005 and I decided no, uh, now I'm doing music full time again. So I got a job uh, with the good people at Long and McQuaid where the music, uh, not sure if the music began there, but it certainly uh, is supported well there. Great organization. And uh, I worked as a pro audio rental associate uh, until 2010. At which point in time I decided uh, I'd had enough of retail and I got a job with uh, Ray Williams at Music Marketing in the music wholesale industry as a product specialist for RME, audio interfaces, Sonox plugins, some other software, uh, FL Studio, uh, TL Audio. And I did that until 2012, at which point in time I decided it was time for something different. So the position of registrar and financial aid administrator became available at Harris Institute for the Arts in Toronto, a private uh, uh, post-secondary school career college. Uh, and I applied for the job and uh, John Harris hired me. So. Um, at that time, I became a music education administrator. Uh, I also became active uh, in the Audio Engineering Society Toronto section in 2009. I was the member of the, I joined the executive committee in 2010. I was the uh, chair of the uh, membership committee. Uh, I was nominated as VP in 2011. Uh, I was nominated uh, and elected chair in 2013, remained on the executive committee to 2015, or I should say 2018, uh, is still uh, actively involved uh, in the AES, great organization. Uh, that's why we have standards and uh, we keep manufacturers honest and uh, help educate pro audio professionals. That's our mandate. In 2017, I decided it was time for something different again. So Susan and I sold our house in Toronto, moved to Cambridge, and I started uh, building my latest home studio as well as uh, playing a lot more guitar and doing a lot of woodworking. In December of 2017, uh, Denny Tremblay moved to Cambridge and we reconnected at a Christmas party. 
And Denny said to me, what do you do on these days? And I said, well, I'm uh, doing a lot of woodworking because I love woodworking and I'm doing whatever music stuff I can. Some live sound and some recording and some writing. To which Denny said, well, I want to start a company making electric guitars and electric guitar amplifiers and I have my own designs. Would you like to do that with me? And I said, hell yeah. And here we are, 2022. As you can see, Norfolk and Jarvis Audio Technologies is alive and well. We make our own guitar bodies, our own necks. We wind our own pickups. We use stainless steel frets and premium hardware because we want professional player grade instruments. You can see what we're up to these days at www.norfolkjarvis.ca. And my love for music and my career in audio continues. So thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be with you. And thanks again to the AES Toronto section. And uh, good evening. Good evening. My name is uh, Denis Tremblay, otherwise known as uh, Dennis Tremblay, if you prefer. And the uh, palatial surroundings here are my workshop. So it's not beautiful, but it's functional. So the question is, how did my love of music lead to a career in professional audio? So it's kind of an interesting question. Um, I don't think anybody wandered into professional audio at any point in their life and realized with a shock that people were playing music through those systems. Um, but still, a love of music is kind of a prerequisite. I don't think anyone does this work and are unconcerned about music. So for me, it started quite a while ago. You know, I've sort of reached the age where I'm becoming an ancient monument now. Um, it really goes back to the middle 1960s, in 1967 exact, to be exact. My brother had been following the, the British invasion and buying the records and uh, just generally being enthusiastic about that whole scene. And of course, I was there listening with him on his uh, Sears record player, you know, complete with four inch loudspeakers. So high fidelity was something we'd never heard of and had no clue about at the time. We just loved those records. Around the same time, coincidentally, in that year of 1967, when many other things happened, it was the Sgt. Pepper's and the first Jimi Hendrix record and all those good things. I discovered that the public library allowed you to take books home, which I thought was utterly amazing. Why would they do that? Um, what I also discovered is that they had a section which dealt with technical topics for young people. So it was possible then to go to a library and get a book that taught you how to build something when you were you know, 10 or 11 years old. And that book was aimed at your level of comprehension and skill. So the first book that I got, which was relevant to my later career, was a book called The Boy's First Book of Electronics. It was um, aimed strictly at, uh, at uh, newbies, beginners, age 11 to 14 roughly, so def definitely my demographic at the time. And it showed you how to build things that would make noises. You could build a code practice oscillator if you wanted to learn your Morse code for your ham license. And it had some simple circuits for receivers, but the one that really interested me is that it had an audio amplifier circuit in it. Very, very simple, single-ended uh, pentode output, a half-wave rectifier, triode gain stage, uh, basically the audio section from an All-American 5 radio. Um, and this was to be built literally on a breadboard. You got a piece of, of, of uh, wood, uh, put a metal plate on it that would act as your earth ground, such as it was. And uh, you screwed the parts onto that and, and away you went. So my dad helped out by making that for me. And I guess this was back in the days of uh, free range parenting, where uh, an 11-year-old would be uh, allowed to build a circuit that plugged into the wall and had the parts uh, you know, mounted on a piece of wood where you could go touch things if you felt like it. Uh, I didn't. Um, the amplifier worked. It was a revelation. I thought, wow, you can build stuff that will play music. 
This eventually led to my building a, a turntable for my own use. The, the turntable portion of it was something that I got out of a scrap pile, most likely. I forget the precise details. And I made a tone arm for it because I didn't have one, which I used the, the plastic body from a pan and a bit of plastic from a, a, a solder container. And a phonocart ridge that I managed to scrounge from the local t uh, radio and TV shop. The folks at that shop were very good to me. They would allow me to rummage through their box of tubes and so on. Um, and they would occasionally sell me a component that actually worked. So that was wonderful. Uh, so I built that thing, um, improved the fidelity over my brother's record player by buying a six inch loudspeaker from the same shop and having my dad build a wooden box that we could wedge up in the, uh, in the floor joists in the basement where all this happened and have a listen. So already well established and interested in music at that point, my mother had always been uh, quite musical, an accomplished singer, she sang, along with uh, pop records of her day, and was quite good, so we had music in the house. Around uh, about the time I got into high school was the beginnings of what we, I guess we would call the rock era, prog rock and so on, the first Led Zeppelin records and all of these kind of things. And these were messages from, from far away. These were cultural milestones. We recognized them when they arrived. You know, they, they informed us about how we should think and how we should uh, look and how we should sound. And this led to further experimentations in audio. So by the time I was in high school, um, I soon became the guy who ran the PA system for the, the school events. Uh, we had a nice uh, Shure PA system, if anyone remembers those, with the two column speakers, basically line arrays. I don't know if they were intended to be, but they behaved that way. And a bunch of Shure microphones, all high impedance, quarter inch jacks. And, and I became the guy that did that. This turned out to be quite a lot of fun. And at one point, they organized the traveling tour, which they say in French, or Café Chantant is basically a coffee house thing, a variety show that the, the school drama and music department put together. And we took this on the road to other high schools. So not only was I operating the PA system, but we were doing road trips and I'm going on tour with that PA system. So this was a very, very, very cool thing to be doing. Again, this is all driven by music. You know, we're playing popular hits of the day, many of them the francophone hits of the time. And it was all about the music. It still remains all about the music. The transition at that time from, you know, small scale public address stuff began to appear when things like modified Altec A2s or replica cabinets of A2s with hot rodded components began to show up for PA systems and so on. Um, also in high school, you know, to earn extra cash, um, I'd connected up with a fellow who ran, uh, who was basically a, um, a small, um, you know, back alley uh, stereo shop. This was the kind of thing that was popular during the time, you know, discount stereo gear. And he had some quite some good stuff. So literally his name was Charlie Brown. And imaginatively, he named the store Charlie Brown Stereo. So I worked for him part time as a student uh, evenings and weekends. And uh, I don't think I ever took home a nickel in pay from that store. I took it all home in gear. So by the time I was 17, I had uh, a Dynaco SCA35 vacuum tube amplifier, uh, an AR turntable and a pair of AR6 loudspeakers so that I could play my prog rock albums on. And this was all a very big deal. From that point on, um, started to become interested in what live opportunities were available. I haven't gotten the taste of that in high school. And uh, this was about the time that the Northern Lights Folk Festival, Festival Boreal, became something in Sudbury and they started to put on live acts. And it became a place where I actually saw real musical gear. Just as an aside, I mean, the first piece of official uh, musical gear, real musical instrument that I ever saw was my brother's friend Tony showed up one day with this gorgeous, huge, bright red guitar. And it just looked as professional as anything. Um, and I had really no idea what I was looking at at the time. I realized today that I was looking at a Gibson ES-335. And this was like uh, um, an apparition from another planet. It was beyond anything I had ever seen. And again, I realized, wow, there is real stuff out there to be had. 
So progressing through that, um, you know, eventually to school to get some official electronics training, and then uh, back to the old hometown. Things at that time were beginning to slow down a little bit, um, and I saw an advert in the paper, and there were adverts in the paper then for jobs, um, for some technical positions at Capitol Records at EMI Music in Mississauga. I applied for that. I got it. Thank you, Dan Middleton. And then began my career in audio, at least as it's known in Southern Ontario. And this was for an actual for real music company. Um, you know, back in the day, there were such things as record companies who made actual records and sold them and marketed them and developed uh, bands and talent in order to do that. So we were on the technical end of this, but at the same time, you know, we were part of the greater enterprise and it was kind of a great fun thing to be doing. It uh, felt like a privilege, and in some senses it was. There weren't a lot of people involved in doing this stuff. Uh, at that time, there was a transition from vinyl to cassette, so we worked on a lot of cassette gear, designed and built electronics. This was almost the tail end of the era where custom electronics were the thing. Uh, you know, back in the 50s and the early part of the 60s, many studios, broadcast facilities, uh, manufacturing facilities built their own gear and you can see some of this stuff on youtube where you know somebody at uh, have your road or whatever will go over some uh, classic console that was built by the engineering staff so i was fortunate enough to see the tail end of this um, the goal of course in building all that stuff beyond you know, the convenience of getting exactly what you needed is that we we're continually working to improve the quality of what we we're making the sound quality is what drove us and again, this is a, the all devoted to supporting the music. It's the music that drove this. It's the music that drove the business. It's the music that drove our efforts into building the better gear. It, it was the stuff that we listened to day in and day out. Um, one of the great benefits, I have to point out, having worked for an old school record company like that, is that however narrow your personal interests in music were before you began, they broadened out to the entire spectrum of music because you got to hear it all every day, all the time. And very soon you began to have an appreciation for just about any kind of style of music. Um, and you kind of enjoyed all the new stuff as it came along. Anyway, uh, you know, this was again, uh, again, driven by the interest, the love of music. Uh, there was no one on the staff there who wasn't either a musician or an ardent audiophile in some way. It was a musical environment and it was all about music. The same when I eventually transitioned and moved away from uh, EMI to Sony Music, the early days of uh, CD production. And again, this was driven by the interest in music. The, the, the um, company itself helped to support an interest in music by having artists come in and perform for us, um, by uh, making something of a big deal of new releases so that we knew what the new releases were all about and, and anticipating that they're coming out and getting an opportunity to hear them and so on. It was truly driven by music. There, you know, obviously was a time when these businesses uh, began to have a bit of trouble. This was the downloading era. I'm sure everybody will remember some of that or will have read about it. And the nature of those businesses changed. Uh, my interest in music didn't change, but unfortunately I had to choose a different line of employment as that industry shrank rather dramatically. Eventually this led to opportunities in the movie business um, you know, after going through several stepping stones on my way there to work for IMAX Corporation, who are an iconic company, um, uh, you know, well known for the, the large screen stuff. And again, working with their sound systems. In this case, you know, perhaps a little bit more than music was involved. You know, these were, uh, were were movies, and uh, you know, it was not necessarily all about the music, but the music was a big element. And the uh, you know quality of the delivery of soundtracks became a big deal because it's a great contributor to the sense of realism. You know, you could present those beautiful images without sound, but it certainly wouldn't have the uh, same sense of realism. So sound four movies became something of a passion. It was a great interest and it was a, a, a significant uh, focus of, of interest in the company as well. So at no point in any of these things uh, did any of this become pursued strictly for the technology's sake. The technology is interesting. The work through the, uh, the uh, transition from the analog to the digital era, moving from analog tape to digital formats and so on. 
But these were all about what was on them, effectively. It all had to be better. It all had to sound better. It all had to work better to support the music, to support the, the, the content which was meant to entertain and to enthrall, to amaze people. It truly is about the music. Uh, my latest uh, personal endeavors with musical instruments is a long-standing interest of mine. This goes back again to high school days where I was building things like guitar amplifiers for friends and modifying guitars and doing and so on. So my interest, uh, if, you know, what do I do with my spare time? Well, what little spare time I have, I use to build guitars and guitar amplifiers and such things because I love the music. I play myself. So this was a new exploration, um, discovering new technologies, new methods, and uh, uh, reviving a long-standing interest in woodwork, which had been something that my dad and I had been involved in when I was much younger. Again, in the per in the with the purpose of in, not in this case just supporting music, but to create music. So that's another aspect of the technologies that we work with and the career paths that we take, is that. You know, the Audio Engineering Society is really uh, intended to be about the technology of, of audio, but the technology of audio is also the technology of music creation. And the technology of music creation is also the technology of audio. Well, these things are, are connected and intertwined and, and don't really exist separately. You know, the venerated uh, vintage guitar amplifier designs, well, those were based on hi-fi amplifiers of the day. The, the output stages of these classic amplifiers were virtually identical to the hi-fi amplifiers that were available, and the people who were building these things were adopting those circuits, uh, circuits rather as, as uh, the best practices uh, with the hope of getting the best high-fidelity results out of those uh, musical instrument amplifiers. Much of the history of the technology of, of, of uh, musical instruments, especially of electrified guitars and, and basses and so on, you know, worked in lockstep essentially with the, the, the hi-fi business of the day. So the creation of the music, the playback of the music, all of these things were tied together. It's one continuous spectrum. And the love of music I, it, it drives all of us. Uh, it would be hard to imagine anyone who would uh, consider a career in professional audio who wasn't dedicated to the music in one way or another or wasn't strongly influenced by music in one way or another. Many professional audio people are musicians, whether they're practicing musicians or not. Uh, they understand music, they love the music, they're there for the music, they're interested in the gear for the music. It's all about the music in the end. So, thank you very much. Those are my thoughts on the topic, and uh, good to see you all again. Bye now. For more information on the Toronto Audio Engineering Society, go to torontoaes.org. There you will find notifications on our upcoming events, past events, Masters of Audio, and our member showcase. The Toronto AES is brought to you by Solotech, Gear Audio, Sonotechnique, Bell Media, YSL Pro, Electrosonics Canada, BRTB, Global USS, Adamson, Lawo, avshop.ca, Q5X, and the executive team of the Toronto Audio Engineering Society. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, today, it's my privilege to be speaking with Arthur Kelm. Um, Art, really good to see you. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, could you uh, do the kindness of introducing yourself, please? Uh, yeah, as I said, how, how do you introduce oneself when you've been with yourself your whole life? You know, it's, so anyway, I'm Arthur Kelm. Uh, I do a lot of things. Uh, power and grounding is one of them. And running recording studios is another thing that I do. So I guess I can say I have two hats. I run recording studios when I can, and I'm always doing power and grounding and product development, and things to do with clean power and making your power better. And I guess to say in my world, if you make your powers better, you have a more stable studio, you have a more stable environment, and things last longer and run better. So uh, 
what can I say? I mean, that's kind of what I do still. I travel over the country consulting and telling people how to do power grounding because there seems to be a void, especially in the recording studio void. But, you know, anyhow, so yes, that's what I do and that's who I am. So it's win-win. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. At this point, yes. Um, okay, so where did it all begin? Let's go back to the start. Uh, how did you first become interested and realize that you had a passion for, uh, for well, what guess, you do? I guess maybe eighth grade. Yeah, I'll start with eighth grade. Because uh, all my, well, the guys I hung out with, the guys that I called my friends that I hung out with, were all musicians and or, you know, 11, 12, 14 year old musicians, if you, you know, you know, newbies, wannabes, whatever. Uh, I never really wanted to be a musician. I always just enjoyed hanging out and fixing stuff. So I started as a young kid, just changing tubes and amplifiers to, for my buddy's amps when they wouldn't work right, it didn't sound right. So, no, so I've been around the business, I guess the business, was it a business back then when I was like a teenager? But no, I've, I've, I've always enjoyed music and enjoyed live music and hence a technician slash tube swapper and doing, I guess, what's called today front of house. But, you know, back when you're in eighth grade, it's really, there's no PA. It's just a bunch of amplifiers and a drummer and everybody plugged their mic into the front of their amp. And I was the friend that walked around and balanced it out and went, oh, no, you don't play so loud. No, you play a little louder. And, you know, hence, hence you become a front of house person, right? Engineer, producer, yeah, all yeah, in real right. time. And, and, yeah, engineer, producer, and technician. So, no, so, I mean, and, you know, going through the years, it's just, I always worked with musicians and, you know, had the opportunity in the early seventies to, to move to Los Angeles and got into more, more into the recording industry. And uh, yeah, the rest is, you say history. It just went by way too fast for me. I'll tell you that. But, you know, starting, I said one of my first gigs in LA, uh, actually it was a small studio. It was a uh, Chateau recorders on Coingo Boulevard. And there was a little jazz studio. Uh, so that was kind of cool. And I, then I, then I graduated, from there to, you know, I guess you say the big leagues when I went to work at Record One, which was Val Gray studio. And all of a sudden we're doing, you know, James Taylor's and Linda Ronstadt's and, you know, all the late seventies, early eighties. What would you call that? Pop? Country pop? Could you call sure. it country? I mean, Linda Ronstadt, I don't know. It was kind of, kind of country, but kind of pop. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, you know, certainly a, a distinctive, you know, like going back to the tradition of the birds and, and uh, Graham Parsons solo and the Burrito Brothers and, and that, you know, the West yeah. Coast, West Coast kind of country attitude. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, flying Burrito Brothers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Poco and, you know, the Eagles for that matter. New Riders and yeah, I mean, even that, that the, you could lump the dead in maybe too. <laughs> <laughs> but that was that day and age and, and everyone recorded live in the studio and that was you know, from the 70s through the 80s and into the 90s is when I'll say live recording started to fade and it became more of the bedroom culture of, of, of recording. I mean, I, I, I find the 80s, the 80s were the onslaught of the home, home studio. Although at least in the 80s, when you had a home studio, you actually had a tape machine and a recording console. And, you know, the 90s came, came ADATs and Pro Tools ADATs format. You know, ADATs and D88s and, you know, uh, I, you know, I would say my personal perspective is that the 90s was the demise of the music industry. Because <laughs> all of a sudden stuff was not being recorded very well, but yet it was still selling and making money. So record company executives don't care about the sound of music, do they? Care about the bottom line. Bottom line, yeah. So I, I felt the 90s was a pretty pretty bleak time in, 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 in the recording industry for high quality recording with some exceptions i think yeah well well yeah there were there were i mean it, was, it wasn't a total wasteland but but it certainly the majority of things being recorded in the 90s on da88s and, and adats was not the best quality recordings you know known to mankind you know no 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 one's using a master off an, an adat for uh, shall we say speaker demonstrations at, at, at hi-fi shows <laughs> right I mean, indeed i mean i i'm, I'm not going to pick a band because i'm that, that'd be dissing somebody but there was not a lot of quality recording going on in the 90s some people did but 
for the most part, it was not that not that great. So, well, then the, then the 2000s came back around. Things got better again. You know, digital digital audio finally caught up to what analog was in the 80s and early 90s. And so, I would say in the you know 2000 mid 2000 you know, like 2008 9 10, that's when digital recording caught up to analog recording in terms of sonic quality. It only took 20 years, but <laughs> they caught up. So. Well, um, I love the title of George Martin's autobiography, All You Need Is Ears. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, I, I listen, I've, I've got some recordings from the 1950s where just very, you know, simple, maybe even just a single microphone or a, a pair of microphones. And the, the sound is just stellar. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, like, 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 like I'll, I'll pull out my, you know, like Miles Davis stuff. Miles Davis stuff was not recorded with a lot of microphones. It was recorded direct to two track. So yeah. it's like you, you play it and it's recorded. You yeah, didn't get Sonny it right. Rollins. You go back and play it again. Sonny know? Rollins, another, another real good yeah. example. So, yeah. I'm, so that's, so that, that's, that's, you know, that's, but I'll, I'll, I'll digress for a second. I found over the years uh, that as equipment changed and as technology changed, things got more and more sensitive uh, to power and grounding. Hence, hence I, 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 in the 80s, started diverting my energy into power and grounding in studios because I found that, because I was doing a lot of home studios and you know some things were quiet, some things weren't so quiet and things that were quiet in one guy's room, take it to another room and it wasn't so quiet. And that's when I started digging into why, why is this stuff changing? What's, where's my common denominator? And it always ended up coming out to be power and grounding. And, and people weren't really doing best practices, I'll like put it nicely, uh, as far as power and grounding goes. They just, you know, you know, plug their power strip into the nearest outlet and call it a day. And, and that wasn't, well, as, as equipment changed, people say equipment advanced. Well, it got cheaper, I'll say that. But with that came more vulnerability. And, you know, things are more sensitive to power and grounding, you know, like, I'll say lexicon, for instance, and the eight in, with their digital reverbs, those those were very prone to ground loop noise or just system noise. Uh -huh. And it would just take an amplifier and you go, well, that's this gotta be better somehow. So so that's when I went down the power and grounding rabbit hole in the 80s and never came out. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, just kept, just kept on going through the rabbit hole. Oh, let's look what you know, how's this, how's that? And you know, that's when I got in, introduced to Plytron that obviously is, is now Taurus Power, but you know, also controlled power company out of Michigan and you know, places where I would call and talk to the engineers and go, so here's my situation. What do you think the best solution is for a power conditioner or an isolation transformer? Or, you know, again, then learning about isolation transformers and the differences between you know, single shielded versus triple shield and the difference between fl flat copper isolation transformers and toroidal transformers and all the nuance of, of power and grounding the importance of a low impedance connection to ground for sure yes. yeah yeah and, yeah and for filtering and then you get into filtering you get into spike and surge suppression again that, and there, there, there we are now in the rabbit hole once you're down that at that hole you start going oh and then what if i do this oh then if i well what if i have regenerated power versus just taking power from the street and trying to clean it up is it can i just regenerate power so again there's there's it's there's a lot of options in power and grounding. Well, you know, you can think about we went from shellac to vinyl to magnetic tape to compact discs to downloads to streaming. Right. But electrical power is a constant. You know, it hasn't hasn't really changed. And if anything, like you say, the requirement for good power has uh, has, you know, it's become more important. Correct. Yeah. I mean, well, again, things things are more sensitive to. Well, there's more sense of, well, I'll say to spike in surges, to outages, and then you know, things coming back on. So, you know, as, as we always talk about, you're, there's two, two, two veins of power and grounding. It's basically performance of your equipment and protecting that equipment from damage due to, you know, a, a, should we say abusive uh, utility companies? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who really don't care what, what the power quality is they're sending out to you. As long as the lights are on, you're good. So... Yeah, so there's there's lots of avenues there, and again, you know, along with like the Taurus line, 
there, there's lots of different solutions to solve a problem. And, and again, I think some people think that, oh, well, I'll buy a power conditioner and it's all, it's fixed. Well, you really have to look at what the problems are and look at what the circumstance you're in, in terms of what kind of equipment are you protecting? What kind of equipment are you using? So uh, if there's engineering involved. I look at it as there's engineering involved in every, in every, every installation that's different. I mean, you can't, it's not a one size fits all. Otherwise you just make one transformer. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Over the day. Or in the case of spike and surge suppression, you would just make one unit and, and you put it everywhere. And that's not the case. There's clearly service entrance. Well, maybe it's not clear to all people, but there is service entrance spike and surge suppression. There is sub panel level spike and surge suppression. Then there's point of view spike and surge suppression. Yep. So it's, you know, it's the same thing in electrical systems. There's the power distro coming in and then there's the system inside the system or systems inside systems. And I would break that down as to you come into a building and you're going to have motor loads. Uh, you're going to have just general usage loads, and then you're going to have electronic loads, and they can't all share the same panel. So that's when you get, get into engineering inside of a facility. I say, okay, well, how, how much clean power do you need? I mean, how much electronics do you have? All right, how many motor loads do you have? You know, motor loads could go from anything from pump motors to air conditioning motors to refrigeration motors. It's a yeah. motor. And, and then you know, utility, which is basically your lighting, I, I look at that. It's like, like the lights are on. Okay, what kind of lights do we have, and how do they reflect back into a system? So, okay, hence the rabbit hole I live in. <laughs> <laughs> so, to to get to where you are, um, obviously, there's been a lot of seat of the pants. There's been a lot of uh, on the job learning. Um, was was there any any training as part of your background as well? Any yes, any well, formal formal yes, stuff? I, I actually went to a very wonderful it and t trade school which was a three-year program to qualify for a for a, a double e in electronic engineering so I, I did three years there got out with and they they called it an equivalency meaning that if you wanted to get a full double e you had to go to a, a local college or a state college to get the math not just i shouldn't say math uh more math but also history and english and all the things that round out at double e electives so, yeah so i i opted i i was going to do that but i got a job as soon as i got out of out of out of trade school after three years i went right into a job at rockwell as, as an engineer and I, I didn't really need to finish the credited you know double e i was double e but it just wasn't a double e on paper so again there so was no back. looking back yeah so I, I looked i worked at rockwell for a couple of years uh as a uh as a satellite test equipment technician, because what, what, we, what we were doing there was first generation of PCM, you know, pulse cold modulation technology for telephony. So we were taking like 27 phone lines and putting them on one line with pulse cold modulation. And we were basically doing satellite, we we're from central office to central office via satellite links for, for, for telephony. So, Around what year? Uh, that was 71, 72. Okay, so would that be eight bit audio then? Oh yeah, okay. yeah. But it was like it was the first PBS. I mean, it, actually, what what where uh, the the company was actually called Westcom that got purchased by Rockwell. Uh, but the two owners of Westcom developed the first PBX system for office buildings. So that 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 was their that was their intro into PCM technology, where they say we we have phone so many phone lines coming in, but we have all these phones in the building. How do we distribute and you know utilize that? And then they took that from central office to satellite, central office to central office, and I would say then the rest is history because as as we know now, digital technology with satellites is that's what it is. I mean, but in the seventies it was brand new. Oh yeah. And so I was, uh, you know, again I was I was working there as a technician, and uh, on weekends I was doing live sound and working with bands and so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, and at, at, at one summer, we'd, uh, we, I, I had vacation time coming and the company was closing two, for two weeks for uh, factory inventory. This, you know, that happens every, every year or two for, with big factories and we were a big factory. Uh, so I took a month off and there was a seminar at, at the Brigham Young University uh, that I said, and it was gonna be Bill Putnam speaking and 
uh, a few other people that were in my work at the time, renowned as 1974, mind you, going on to 75. Uh, that, that these are the guys in, in, in the music oh, business. Yeah. And it was a, a, a two-week seminar on electronics. It was filter design. It was, it was a full-on, you know, what, what do you know about electronics? So it, it wasn't a... It wasn't, it wasn't a seminar for uh, people that didn't already have a degree in engineering. It was a real engineering course, you know, where Bill Putnam taught a course on filter design, uh, you know, for EQs. Like, so this, we designed a filter. This is I, IEEE stuff then. Yeah. So, so again, at that point, I uh, ended up, uh, Todd Fisher, who was Debbie Reynolds' son, Todd Fisher, Debbie Reynolds, you know, Eddie Fisher. Yeah, yeah you know, Carrie Fisher. Uh, anyway, I met Todd at the seminar and he was lamenting over the fact that his mother could only get six wireless microphones to work on stage at a time and she needed 13. So they were doing, they were using some Edcore stuff, some Schwintech stuff and some Vegas stuff because those were the only two companies manufacturing wireless microphones at the time. So I looked at him because here I am doing satellite communication work at, at 23 years old and Looking at him going, what? They can't get microphones? What? How is this possible? What, you know? So uh, he talked to his mother and I said, you know, I can, I can make this work. Just give me the names of the manufacturers. Give me a contact. I'll call them and we'll design a system that, that makes sense. So out of that, I got a job working for Debbie Reynolds on a, on a project designing a, a custom wireless microphone system for her. And out of the three companies, Edcor is the only company that said they thought they could do it. The other two companies said, no, this, this, that's just too hard. It's just, and it's not worth it. We don't care. But Edcor went, that's interesting. 13. So we, I worked with their, their two lead engineers for a couple of months in, in Southern California, Costa Mesa, actually, developing the first rack mount wireless microphone system. And so we had 15, oh, we had 16 wireless microphones because it was, it was a dual pack. There was, there was there was two units in, in, in each rack mount and they were all tunable so I could I could move frequencies around it was, it was it was all in the UHF the band we were working so when when we traveled to a different town I'd have to do a sweep of the UHF band make sure I had no interference but we ended up with 15 16 wireless microphones working at the same time well, th what you said about Edcore makes me uh, think of a Frank Zappa quote. He said, the uh, mind is like a parachute. It only works when it's open. Yeah. <laughs> and they were open-minded. So, well, so. no, they were. And they were really good engineers. And it was just a matter of us sitting down and, and figuring out all the, you know, two months of details. Like, okay, how are we going to deal with this problem? Okay. And when you have three and four people sitting around brainstorming on something, and back in the Disney days, because I did work at Walt Disney Imagineering for a period of my life, it's a, it's, it's a, it's that blue sky mentality where, well, hey, how do we do this? So, exactly. And, and you just, you, 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 you approach it with, with an open mind, like a kind of blue sky approach where in a perfect world, we, that we, could, we could do this. This is how it works. And then you, then you have to say, well, but that's going to cost too much. So what's, what's our compromise? And then you, then you start you know, coming back into reality with what, what a product could cost, where, where the margins are, so on and so forth. So. But it, it that got me to North that you know in 1975 that got me to in into Los Angeles, working for Debbie on the road mainly, and then that led to me getting a job at Chateau Recorders and staying in Los Angeles and then moving on to, you know, uh, building my first studio in Hawaii in 1977, which was I was 26 years old and that was that was my that was, that was my first really big experience with power. Because for some reason, and it was, I had spectrosonic power amps and spectrosonic console. That was the specified system to go in there. And when I fired it up, first day, amplifiers worked for about an hour and a half, and they, I, I, I blew up power transistors. I'm going, what the hell's going on? So another, another day later, another 10 amplifiers later, uh -oh. uh, I, I, I said, what the hell? And I decided to check the power. And the power was 135 volts. Oh my! <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. And I said, "How the hell did that happen?" Well, the guys that installed the isolation transformer for the project tapped it wrong and didn't double check to see what the output voltage was. And at 134, 135 volts, the amplifiers 
would work, but then they would get really freaking hot and blow out power transistors. So that's when I went, I need to double check electricians. Every time I do an installation, I should probably stick my meter in, in the socket before I plug my equipment in. So that was the first what? time I got bit, that got bit in the butt really big, you know, by electricians at 26. So I never got over that. <laughs> <laughs> So th there's been a lot of water go under the bridge between the early 70s and today. Um, you must have encountered some mentors along the way. Uh, any Anybody that, uh, I mean, you mentioned Bill Putnam already. Any any uh, others that you can think of that uh, that help, helped and, and uh, you know, helped help turn on the lights? Well, you know, I, I would say, I'm trying to think of, think of that. But when it comes to power and grounding, I would say no. Uh, because there was no one that knew me. I mean, maybe there's one or two electricians that I learned best practices from, meaning like just how a panel board should look, you know, how wires are bundled and stuff. But when it comes to actually real knowledge about, oh, all right, this, you know, this is how, it, you know, I, I kind of figured that out on my own. And I would say by talking to, well, uh, you know, guys at the factory, you know, like, like at, like at Plytron, you know, talking to Henry, you know, Henry is a, a great source, you know, uh, I, I, I guess I should call Henry a mentor because you know, Henry did a lot of his answer questions for me that I, I, I couldn't put it together for and stuff. But I, I, then in my head, it's more of a, a, a collaboration of sitting down with, with a electrical engineer or a transformer engineer and, and interacting with how I use the transformers and how transformers affect me on, on my side of, of the transformer versus a guy in, in you know, sitting behind a desk designing transformers, you know, and all the, and all the math that goes with, you know, transformer saturation, headroom, blah, 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 blah. So, but again, that type of stuff I learned from Henry about headroom and transformers, you know, at what point does it, you know, at what point it, it can dynamic current draw go before it's current limited because of the physics of the transformer itself. I think so saturation, is that, that yeah, the word? Exactly. And, yeah. and, and, and and how does that affect sound? You know, I mean, just because you maybe measure uh, 50 amps and you have a 100 amp transformer, well, there that's 50 amps RMS steady state. That's not dynamic current draw out of that transformer. And at some point, that transformer may hit a current point where it saturates, and now your pure clean sine wave is a little flat topped. Mm, you hit, you just hit a hard limit. The so, you know, stuff like that, and Henry talked, you know, saying there's been a you know, couple of guys that control power company that I talked to on the phone about, you know, again, I had the situation. It's not, it's not making sense to me. You know, this should work this way and that should work that way. And then, then you get into going, okay, so what's, what's different about this situation? Is it too much, too much harmonic content on the load or what, you know, again, I'm, I'll say that's part of that rabbit hole when you're troubleshooting power issues with transformers, you know, I say, you know, how do you solve those problems? And, and I, I, I tend to believe that you solve those problems with the help of factory engineers that can give you the parameters of, of, of product and, you know, make sure you have the best product for what you're trying to accomplish. So there's been a few times people say, eh, I wouldn't use that transformer. I would use this transformer. That's going to be better suited for your application. And that's, and I say, type it's more so you know, sizing location of you know, where the transformer goes in the chain how close to the load center it is all that but uh, but to answer it on the other side i would say people like val gray and george massenberg and uh, people then recording engineers of that elk were the guys that pushed me to make their equipment work better so i, I would I put in a sense of if someone says to me, you know, that sounds a little fuzzy. I don't know. That's not, that doesn't sound right to me. Then I would start, I would start looking for, okay, why doesn't that sound right? And usually when things don't sound right, it goes back to some type of power supply or power issue, you know, be it the power supplies and the piece of equipment aren't getting enough voltage, you know, from the source, like say, for instance, a good example, be an ATR 102 tape machine, right about 110, it starts to drop out of regulation, the power supply does, and, be, and becomes noisy. At 105 voltage in, it becomes unusable. So when I, when you're troubleshooting stuff in the studios, like I said, it's just not, well, gee, why is that tape machine distorting? 
we can go, well, it's distorting because it's power supply is dropping out of regulation and that's happening because the voltage being supplied to it is, is insufficient. So that's that, you know, so again, a lot of my powers thing came out of working with engineers that were particularly particular about sound and hearing things and had the ears to hear it and point out to me, all right, that doesn't sound right. What, what do you, what do you think's going on? And then, you know, I would go down and I'll take two paths on that. One, one is a power path and the other is just the electronics. I mean, what are they using for input transformers for audio? Are you saturating that transformer going into the unit? Is that why it sounds funny? I mean, you know, again, it's audio troubleshooting. And, and but, cabling as well, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, and, but again, what I think, well, where I got over or got the reputation for being really good is the fact that I just didn't look at it as, oh, let me look at the audio signal path. I looked at the audio signal path and at this power signal path and, and made sure that everything was up to par. Because again, if, you're, if the power is not right, meaning if it's distorted, meaning if it's uh, you know, not, not, if it's too low or doesn't have enough current supply capability, well, things don't sound right. So you got you have to look at it. You have to look at both sides of that. And, and most and most 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 engineers that I dealt with or technicians I dealt with never looked at power. That was just something that came out of the wall. And it was always fine. So it, it has to be a combination. Good. Has to be a combination of uh, what you perceive with your hearing and yes. and what you can measure. Correct. So, Correct. so when it comes to measuring, what uh, do you have a, a favorite uh, measuring instrument? Do you have a favorite piece well, of uh, well, test I, equipment? I, I still enjoy my Fluke 43B, even though it's it's considered by Fluke out of date and they don't support it anymore. But I, I just I just don't see. I looked at their new stuff, and it has more bells and whistles, but it's it's still the same. You're looking for harmonic content. You're looking for uh, you know to log a system so you, so you can you know see if there's any times a day where voltage is high and voltage is low. I mean, I look at the Fluke 43B as pretty much an all around tool for troubleshooting a system you know, for noise and you know, distortion and again, power factor. I mean, it's, it's really, I mean, that's my favorite tool in the toolbox. Has but, the price gone up since they were discontinued? Uh, no, you can actually buy them on eBay very cheap. Oh, wow. So, yeah, yeah, because my uh, unit was like close to five thousand dollars new back twenty years ago, and now you can pick that pick up a forty three B on 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 Amazon for you know, fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred bucks. So it's still a, a good, it's still a good buy. Should you know, we keep that a secret? Should I edit this part out? No, you can you can have <laughs> and, You know, let 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 Fluke get inundated with 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 people with forty three Bs that want them repaired. And they, and last time I called because. Mine failed finally, and I called and said, "Well, you send it back for repair." They said, "We don't repair those anymore. We have these new units that are eight to ten thousand dollars." I went. I looked at it. I considered spending eight to ten grand for a meter, and I, I just didn't see the benefits when I could go online and buy a replacement forty-three B for eighteen hundred bucks, which is what I ended up doing, because I just I couldn't justify spending eight thousand dollars on a on, on on a meter that didn't do maybe it had a little more memory. I don't know. It just, for me, it just didn't make sense. I bet you attempted to repair the old one before you went out shopping for a new one. Well, I took it apart anyhow and saw some burnt traces and went, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes, I did take it apart. Yes. Yes, I did. I did. I did. I did do my, my best technical due diligence to see if I could fix it. But when I saw burned traces, I went, no, that's, no, that we're, that's, no. <laughs> well, when I was touring and doing front of house, uh, it, my my approach was, yeah, I'm I'm kind of a systems guy, you know. I can I can uh, put the system together and make it work, and mm -hmm. if if it doesn't work, I can diagnose what component is uh, is not working. But when it comes to repairing that component, I'm going to leave that to the guy who knows about knows more about it than I do. So, well, yeah. Thing too, as you and I both know, in the world of electronics. When I got started in electronics back in the 70s, you could fix stuff. You could fix an 1176 limiter. You could fix stuff. I mean, there were transistors in there. You replace a transistor. You know, then the 80s and 90s came and it was more solid, way more solid state as far as ICs and packages and packages of vets and so on and so forth. Uh, and I would say by the end of the 90s, 
you couldn't fix anything. You were just changing boards. You were you're replacing boards because everything got so yeah you know, condensed, shall we say, and double sided and surface yeah. mount and yeah. And then then now the two thousands like again, I in, in my career in 012, I took over as chief engineer and general manager at Capital Recording Studios in LA, and that was part of a rebuild of the studios. It was a, re, a revamping of the shop and technical staff. And so I found I found myself going out buying things like uh, soldering, desoldering tools, you know, for surface mount components, because you know we could actually fix some of the surface mount component stuff at Capital. So, and I had really four great technicians working, work, working with me there. So we had, at all costs, tried to fix stuff. You know, even if it took, you know, buying special tools to, come on, we can't throw this away. All we need to do is replace that microprocessor and, you know, okay, so we need a special, you know, device that heats up the whole microprocessor, all 105, you know, legs of it, so you can remove it and put a new one in. So, you know, but things have, be, you know, have become, shall we say, almost impossible to repair, you know, even, even, even with your best efforts and you know, my budget that I had at Capital for buying test equipment and tools, some, some things, it's just, you know, with surface mount components, it's just not, not repairable on a component level. Well, if, if it's like the auto industry, that's probably by design. I would think so. Yeah. I would think so. I mean, yeah. And, and I think there's, I think there's, I hate to say it, but there could be, should we say a ticking time bomb built into to the product where it's only going to last for five to 10 years and then it's going to fail and, and, and you have to move on. It's not like, it's not like, you know, Fairchild 670s where, you know, 60 years later, people are still you know, searching them out and repairing them and keeping them alive because people love that sound of that particular, you know, limiter. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't think since 1995, there's been a, a classic piece of audio outboard gear that, you know, is considered a classic piece of outboard gear. I mean, I don't know, a DBX 160. I don't think a DBX 160 qualifies as a classic piece of outboard gear. <laughs> <laughs> what about what about an Apex? Uh, oh yeah, oral exciter Type yeah. C or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apex yeah, oral exciter Yeah, I mean, if you can find one, it was it was it was, it was quite the novelty in, in in the 80s. But no, I mean, digressing. It's Older gear you can fix. Older gear has a sound. Older gear is what it is, and you know, newer gear is this. You know, if they, oh, newer gear, everything these days is a plug-in. So what's it matter? Yeah, I was just going to say, are there plugins gear? that you like? What gear? What people buy plugins? They don't buy gear. You know, <laughs> who and, needs a patch bay? <laughs> yeah, not many people. Trust me. Trust me. That's and that's why the industry has changed over the years. But one thing that stays consistent: power. You always have to plug the shit in someplace. Yeah, yeah. And even if you're plugging in your laptop, it's got to be plugged in someplace. And you know, if the power is really bad, it's just going to affect even your laptop. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's it's been an interesting journey, I should say, of product development, product you know, products coming into the market, the pro products going out of the market. I mean, let's go back to the mid '80s mid to late 80s early 90s with digital tape machines you know you, you, had, you had sony with a dash format and then you had the pcm format and these machines were hundreds of thousands of dollars and they lasted for 10 years maybe 15 at best came and went see about it, you know yeah, yeah. And, now, and now people are hard pressed to find tape machines that work although if you go to iron mountain i'll endorse iron mountain here they have a plethora of old machines that they keep running to do archiving to transfer stuff from you know the old one inch digital format or or the Sony format you know into a, a new hard drive format. So, we, but I mean, see, my point, my, my point is, yeah, my point is, I've just seen just all these just different waves of equipment come and go. You know, the next generation, and you know, again, forty four one versus the uh, you know ninety six versus one ninety two, and you know, sample rates, how much better they got. And, so everything seems to have its have, have its run. It's like a restaurant, right? It's good for 10 years and it's probably gone. <laughs> that seems but, that seems to be the way of the audio industry these days. Uh-huh. 
You mentioned home studios, and I know that you've uh, you've done work for some very well known people. Uh, we've talked at uh, at trade shows and things about uh, work that you've done for people like uh, Don Hanley and and right. Neil Young. Yeah. I'm just I'm curious. And, to know, and Slash in- was a lot of fun. Slash was I did three studios for Slash. He was he's a great guy. Yeah, th- this is this is what I was going to ask. Like you know, in those situations, how how close do you get to these folks i mean is there uh is there a layer of insulation between you and the artist or no, do you get no, to know not, them? no not in those situations no that's 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 when that's when you're almost too close to the artist uh i mean all you know all the clients that i've built home studios for yeah like like barry manilow i'll pick barry manilow barry manilow is very hands-on guy when it, when it comes to his when it came to his home studio it was very simple but he he operated everything himself. He had you know, a little, uh, you know, a uh, sixteen-track tape machine. I mean, it, it was, you know, a little eight. I, mean, I think we had an eight-input console because it was all piano, vocal. He wasn't really doing rhythm, but it was all for him to write and capture and and use later. And then you got, you know, again, different artists had different levels of uh, a personal involvement. I would say, you know, like on the Henley level and the Slash level, Duff, for that matter, they always had engineers working the shit for them they always there was you know they never recorded by themselves they 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 always had someone working and if they did want to record by themselves uh they could then like say with henley if i can remember this one you know setting up a a, a a foot pedal to drop the tape machine into record and hit it a second time to come out of record so i mean everything was set up you know mike every, i mean everything was mike everything the sound was there but we set up so when we when we leave at night, if he had an idea, he could run into the other room, sit down at the piano, and hit record, and just capture that moment, and then uh-huh. you know, stop recording, and there it was. But Don Don wasn't adjusting microphones and you know getting the sound himself. The engineers did that. So there's all these different levels of home studio guys. You know, I I tend to find that guitar players were more hands on. You know, like Steve I types of the world. He recorded everything himself. He got the sound himself. I mean, he's like, which what you hear is what Steve wanted you to hear. And so he was probably the most extreme hands-on person. Because he, I mean, he, and yeah, I mean, it can, he could he could fly a forty-two input or forty-eight input, whatever um, API console by himself with no problem. He, he he could run GML automation, no problem. But you know. That he's Steve Vaughn. He's that guy that wants to be hands-on, do it himself. And then you have other artists that, you know, they just want to they just want to have a home studio so they don't they don't have to go out. And you know, they they bring everybody in, so they're they maybe and maybe at best all they do is hit play on a cassette player or on a DAT player or, or, or a CD, whatever you know, whatever whatever era it was, because that was kind of the sequence: cassette, DAT, CD changer you know, in your home studio. So, yeah, it's, yeah, it was, no, I, I, I got very close because you're dealing with artists and it's their personal use studio. How do you want to use this? Where do you, where do you want to put this at? You know, where are you going to set? I mean, how do you normally work? So, yeah, that's, that's, that's very much a hands-on interface with the artist over the years. I, I read that you were, I think you actually got a credit on a project, uh, that uh, you worked on with uh, Gail Zappa and Dweezil. Yes. Um, that, that, tell that me about record. that. That 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 blows my mind. Well, you know, the Zappas. I mean, I I, I got I well, I got called in that gig because uh, you know Frank had passed away and they wanted to you know, and Dweezil wanted to redo the studio at the house. You know, they had they had a large format uh, Me V. It was a V, I believe. It wasn't V. It was a Me V that was you know twelve years old and it was you know needed recapping severely and it wasn't, it wasn't really worth repairing. So we said, okay, well, let's just, let's just do a new studio. So I, I designed the studio and, and outfitted it with, for, for Dweezil, but at the same time with Gail, it had to be part of the archive uh, signal path. Because, you know, Frank had a large vault with, all, with thousands and thousands of tapes and, uh, all this stuff had to be transferred to digital and you know they they hired joe this great guy uh he, he he was the transfer engineer it was his responsibility to get tapes out of the vault transfer them 
it would be a two track tapes, whatever. I mean, cause you know, cause it was every format you ever wanted to think of. Uh, cause Frank also was really big into the Sony uh, 3324. So there's a ton of 3324 stuff that had to be transferred. So part of the studio design was designing not only the weasel to record, you know, repurpose the studio itself, which was a great studio, uh, but also set the re set the signal path up. So to go from an original, let's say overnight sensation two track, how, you know, what's the signal path to get that off the two track and, 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 and into digital storage. And it, my theory always was less is more. So high quality cables, direct, you know, direct connections. Uh, we had a patch bay, but it was an XLR patch bay, not, not a TT patch bay or a TRS bay. It was oh, just balance. XLR. It was like, so, okay, I'm going to come out of the two track. Boom. I'm going to go into here, wherever we're going to go to, but it was basically one connection or two connections and, and any, and any, and any transfer we did. And so again, so the studio had to work, you know, for transfers and for recording new, you know, new materials. So that was, you know, then I worked for the Zappas up until Gail passed away, but I believe two, three years ago, I worked for, him for 12 or 14 years as a technical consultant and kept the studio running, you know, where to put it, you know, it's the studio running and the uh, mastering chain running. So that was fun, but cause you got to hear a lot of stuff that people didn't really hear and hearing first generation, again, overnight sensation or uh, baby snakes, all this stuff that was all first generation, there's the master. And, you know, Frank made really good sounding records. I'll say that. I mean, everything sounded freaking phenomenal. So, you know, that's fun though. I mean, that's just me having fun, but making a living. So I guess I don't know how to phrase that, but yeah, that, that was just a fun project. And, so any, you know, any other experiences on par with that one that you can think of? But, you know, I, I would, I would have to say that, you know, managing studios like 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 when i managed record one i was the chief engineer and general manager you know dealing with the level of client and the level of, of uh you know say a level of client that came through there was was a lot of fun and then and then taking that from 88 into the complex days with massenberg and, and george massenberg and, Glenn, and greg ladani who were the partners in that studio i was a chief engineer and gm of that and again just making those guys happy which is it you know, wasn't always easy uh but you know, having a world-class studio where artists can come and create and not be inhibited by technology. I always looked at, even when I was at Capital, the last eight years at Capital, the idea was to have a studio that was a cutting edge studio that functioned to capture music and mix music, but not have it be in the way of the artistic, uh, what, 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 what am I looking for? You know, just the artistic flow. I mean, I always thought that if technology got in the way, then it wasn't good technology. That really, you know, the artist is supposed to come to a studio, the producer come to the studio, have fun, make music, and go away. They're, they shouldn't be burdened by, uh, well, wait five minutes, we got to fix this, or wait, oh, this is not working right. I mean, whenever, whenever, whenever technology gets in the way of, of, of the artisan, it's just wrong. So, you know, Can Michael. Can you do that oh, again, please? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait, that was the best take ever. So, of course, and, and that's the one that gets lost. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the ongoing joke in the industry for my whole career is like, yeah, that take, that, that take would have been shit if something didn't go wrong. But so, because something went wrong, it was the best take in the world, and, and we didn't get it. So, <laughs> Funny how that works, huh? Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah it's very serendipitous that way. But again, so my goal, and this gets into, uh, then I digress to power and grounding, Having a, a very stable recording studio means that you have to have a very stable power and grounding system. Uh, like, say, for a good example would be uh, the Neve 88R that's at Capital in Studio A. I put on a on a full online UPS because I, 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 you know, so in the console power supplies, I had a, uh, a 20 kVA UPS system that the console ran off of at 240, and that console never had a problem in eight years. I take that back. It had one problem in eight years. It lost one IC in eight years, and that IC blew because there was a, a fault on that PC board. And so it was a PC board problem that was from manufacturing that ended up lasting three years and failing. But other than that, that console never had a problem. And again, the point of being on a full online UPS 
is that I was regenerating new power all the time. It was always a stable 240 volts, no ups, no downs, no glitches, no pops. You know, if the power utility went away and come, came back, if there was a brownout, that, that console saw nothing yeah. on, on that side of it. And hence, eight years of a 72 input Neve 88R with zero problems. Now, and, that would have to be outside of the control room, I would think, because oh, yeah. it's going to oh, make yeah, yeah. noise, was, right? Yeah, that was a big machine room. But I mean, but the point is, is that if if you have a stable power system and it's in a stable grounding system, equipment tends to work better and longer. That's Absolutely. Online, so, so again, that that that's where I get into you know the technical aspect of equipment, and then also the power and grounding aspect of equipment. And you have to have both sides covered; otherwise, you'll have failures, and otherwise, you're going to, at the worst possible moment, something will fail. So, Indeed. Yeah, but again, I mean, I, I, I just enjoyed being in studios, being with artists, you know, being part of that, part of making records. And or as, as I would say to people, they say, oh, we never see you. I said, that's good, because if you see me, something's wrong. So it's best you don't <laughs> see me, except in the hallway to say hi. But no. And, and that, was, that was always my goal, was to have a studio that never had any downtime, that, you know, Zero downtime was was my goal. At record one, I had a year and a half of, with two rooms of zero downtime, and that was because everything was stable, everything was kept up, everything preventive maintenance. I mean, yeah, what can I say? There's ways to run studios that work. <laughs> then there's ways where they're unstable and they don't work so well. Mm -hmm. So, so the. The pandemic years, and my God, it's been years. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's it's been hard and and it's been difficult. But an upside for us is that you know, for our monthly AES meetings and events, we've moved from in person to online, and thereby broadened our audience. Right, so right, right. we're you know we're this this chat plus, is going to plus people weren't busy. <laughs> well that too but so, this you know this chat is going to be attend. available around the world to anyone who can understand uh, the english language so yes. for sure. our audience um do you have any advice do you have any any thoughts on how to succeed in what you've been doing for your life hmm. that's a good that's a good question uh you know i would say Again, I would, I would base my success on just A, enjoying yourself, being honest, and pursuing what, what, what you enjoy doing. I mean, I, I mean I, it sounds kind of corny, but, you know, when you're having fun, you do a good job. You know, as, as I told any of my staffs that I had at any of the studios, and not to say most recently, it was like 20, you know, we had 30 people at Kaplan staff that I was in charge of. And the whole thing was, I, I it was, I wanted everybody on that staff to get out of bed in the morning, put their feet on the ground and want to come to work. And my mantra was, if you don't want to be here, don't be here, please. If you don't like being here, find another job or let me help you find another job. Because I, I only want people around me and on my staff that really want to be there doing a good job, whatever that may be. And I think the thing about the music industry is that's, that could be anything. I mean, I mean, you know, what, what gets you, why do you want to be in a recording studio? You know, and there's hundreds and hundreds of reasons for that, you know, but it's always something different for everybody. So it really, the recording industry for me has always been a challenge because it's always different every day. I mean, every day is something different. I mean, you never know. I mean, we're not, you know, we're not going to Kaiser Permanente and shuffling paperwork around. It's <laughs> like every day is, you have no idea what's going to happen. So if you're looking for a stable gig, you know, don't get in the music industry because it's probably the most unstable business there is. And it's to the whims of, of, of the artist, to the whims of the producers. I mean, you just never know what's going to happen every, every day in the studio. Yeah, it's, which, it's driven by creativity. Correct, which makes, for me, it makes it fun. I mean, that's the fun part is never knowing what's going to happen. You know? So do now, what again, you love and love what you do. Yeah, but it's, it, and I, again, I think if you're looking for a stable job it's not in the entertainment industry because there's nothing stable in the entertainment industry as far as i'm concerned as far as my 50 years of being in the industry all the changes i've seen 
you, you always have to be open to change. You can't be that person that goes, well, no, it's done this way and that's the only way to do it. That's, you know, that, that doesn't fly because again, as you just mentioned, it's a creative environment, it's a creative culture. And you have to be able to move with creativity or again, have an open mind. When someone says, I want to do this, and you, you don't say, no, that can't be done. You go, really? That's interesting. I wonder how we could do that. So yeah, let's talk to, about it. Yeah, let's talk about what we, what what you want to do and why you want to do it. What, but yeah, and you know, but again, that keeps the mind open, keeps you thinking progressively, if I can use that word. Uh, and like, because you're always looking for a, a new a new answer, always looking for a better way to do things. And you accept that the only constant is change. A hundred percent correct. If you don't, I mean, I actually use that line. When I, I was the chief engineer at Skywalker for a year of my a year and a half of my life, and. I came in, I was changing a bunch of stuff. We were getting ready to do the last three Lucas movies, the set, it's 90, 96, 97. And so we were going from analog consoles to digital consoles. We were just, you know, changing a lot of stuff. And one, and one of the texts was in the elevator really one day, he goes, you know, this is bullshit, man. I hate changes. All this stuff is working just fine. You're changing everything. And I looked and I said, you know what? It's one thing you can count on, my friend, change. Because it happens <laughs> all the time. And get over it. Because nothing stays the same. I said, if, you, if you're using the same gear now that you used 20 years ago, I said, then you're not producing the best product. You're not giving the client the best service. Now, granted, there's classic microphones, there's classic pieces of gear, but that's not what I'm talking. I'm talking about just the overall change in technology, change in, in how we do things. You know, Obviously, in movie theaters, it's all digital. There's no, there's no 35 millimeter rolls of film being shipped around the country anymore. Yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. That's gone. I mean, no one's using two-inch tape. It's gone. You know, they don't even. Well, they make two-inch tape, but let me put it this way: it's not the two-inch tape that I used in the '60s, '70s, and '80s. It's like you know, well, I should say '60s, '70s, and '80s. Uh, you know, tape is a dead format. It's you know, even if you can find two-inch tape, it's not made as well. It's not made the same way. It doesn't sound the same. So, if you want that classic tape sound. You're still hard pressed to get it because tape's not made like ag that used to be made or like any Ampex any, or whomever. Ampex yeah. used to be made, you know, 466, 478, whatever. Pick a model number, but no, it's all different. So you have to accept the fact that, I mean, it was one of the things that capital people comes, well, Art, you should not get, you know, not get rid of the analog tape machines. I said, why? They're, it's gone. I said, you know, we have Pro Tools at 192. I said, why would I want, why would you go to tape? Give me a reason. You know, and, uh, you know, and trust me, there's a, I hated digital for, you know, all the eighties and the nineties, cause I thought it sounded like crap. And finally it started sounding better as in the two thousands. So to now it's like, it really sounds as good as tape. If you, if you, yeah. you, I've, trust me, I've done many tests with, with people record the two inch, record the Pro Tools at 96 or 192. And you'd be hard pressed to hear the difference. I would say maybe two out of 10 people might hear the difference you know so and you you wouldn't hear the difference on uh, earbuds with an iphone <laughs> Your earbuds yeah yeah at 40 yeah never mind yeah an mp3 sounds just like just like just like a two inch master right <laughs> sure sure it does yeah sure it does. I, I know that your son is uh going for a master's right now in yes. electrical engineering right correct and uh, do you think, uh, is that what your legacy is? Is, is he gonna, gonna carry on? It seems like it. I mean, he, he, he's, he's working with me on this power factor correction project because there's a lot of math involved with power factor correction, how you, different ways to get there. Uh, yeah, so he's, he's that, 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 that's our summer project is, is, is the power factor correction unit that I, that I wanna build for the, for the studio slash home theater market. Because uh, right now power factor correction only applies to the industrial market. Uh, it really doesn't apply to the resident. I guess I call it residential. I don't know if I could call it residential, but you know, like the home studio, the studio market, the home studio market. Uh, so I feel there's a void there. So he's working with me, engineering that, and you know, sorting out you know the best approach to again. Do, do we? It, my 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 Rev One products is going to be a set and forget. I'll call it a box where. Again, if you have like five components in your in your AV system, or maybe five components in your recording chain, 
let me let put this box in and you can dial in power factor correction to you think it sounds best and or it, it, it may be power factor correction of, of zero. Okay, that should sound best, but that doesn't mean it sounds best because it's sound and uh, I always look at the thing about sound. It's like anything, it's, it's, it's an opinion. It, it's not a fact. Subjective. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, well, that sounds great. Yeah, some, somebody else may say, that doesn't sound so good to me. So it's, you know, it's, does it sound better if, if, if voltage is, is lagging current by two degrees or does it sound better if it's lagging by 10 degrees or does it sound better if it's zero? I don't know, but I know I'm, I'm gonna build a box that will give somebody that opportunity to listen and see what they think is, sounds best for their, for their re recording chain or for their playback chain. Yeah, so yeah, I think he has a future. I mean, he's working part time uh, for a company in, in, in Hawaii, uh, you know, a, as a junior engineer uh, for a solar company, you know, you know, doing doing solar designs and inverter designs. So we'll see. You know, that's but, pretty futuristic. But, but, They're talking about alternate sources of energy. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. And again, and how, how you clean that up, and you know, how, how you how you deliver that to the customer, and. Again, I was with a friend yesterday, uh, Paul Wilkinson, who has this new product. It's a microgrid, he calls it, which is four sub zeros, you know, all stacked together and oh my. Um, costs over $150,000. But it's all about clean power and putting it in, in, in your home. And, and he has it set up so that there's, there's a section that, that's UPS backed up for all, for all your electronics. There's a section that is, it is for motor loads. So he has this whole big power system. Uh, which he calls a microgrid that if power goes out, you know, if the grid goes out, you can, you can run for two or three days on his system because it ties in the solar and, and it does load shedding of non, non-essential loads. So it's a, it's a great system. Like I said, expensive, but it's everything that, that you would want if you want, if you want to be on and off the grid or back feed the grid on some days, or again, it's, it's a deep product. I mean, that's all I'll say. I mean, he's really thought of a ton of shit in there that I'm, I'm, I was very impressed with the product. Now, you know, known Paul for 20 years, and this he's developed over the last five years. And I've, I, well, I've known for 20 years so as a power consultant. And, you know, Paul's thing was he's an AV installer. He got into power 10 years ago, and he kind of, he and I worked together a lot. And, and initially, then I, I got, I went to Capital, lost, I can't say I lost track of him, but. We just didn't, I just didn't work on many, that many projects anymore with him. And he called me last week, said, look, I got a project for you down south Bay in Palo Alto, come on down. So I went down, I was doing soils testing for, for a, a grounding system. And he goes, all right, I gotta show you something. So he jumps in the car and we go over to this other, other home and here's his big blue you know, microgrid system. And I worked with him on that, he said, 10 years ago when he first had the idea of a microgrid system. Uh, but after 10 years, he's really developed it to a point where it's really impressive. And, and again, does automatic load shut. I mean, you know, motorized circuit breakers that, you know, open and close depending on, on, on demand. I mean, he's, he's, I was, I was, such, I was impressed. So I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, what can I say? There's people when developing the, uh, product. There's people when developing the, product out there, and, and I'm, I'm I still want to develop product, like I said, with the power regenerator and with the power factor correction box and stuff. But it's all meant to make audio systems more stable and video systems for that matter. But again, I'm more of an audio guy, so yeah. So in my world, it's like, hey, let's how do we make audio systems sound better and more reliable? Would you consider submitting an AES paper when uh, when the PFC correction box is uh, further along? Yeah, if you help me write it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got people. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not that. I'm not that great at, at, at writing white papers. I, I, I've, I've attempted. Been, I've done okay, but that's not. That's not my forte necessarily. Explaining what I do, you know, I tend to have a vision and go for it. <laughs> well, how about your son? Uh, who knows? I've, I've, I've not seen him write any papers yet, so it's possible. Because, uh, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, this is something that, that would be of interest to uh, to a lot of uh, AES members and, and right. uh, fans, for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, 
I'll, I'll talk to you in October at the trade shows. <laughs> All right, my friend, I will jump and uh, we'll talk soon. You bet. All right. Thanks again. All right. See you. Cheers. For more information on the Toronto Audio Engineering Society, go to torontoaes.org. There you will find notifications on our upcoming events, past events, Masters of Audio, and our member showcase. The Toronto AES is brought to you by Solotech, Gear Audio, Sonotechnique, Bell Media, YSL Pro, Electrosonics Canada, BRTB, Global USS, Adamson, Lawo, avshop.ca, Q5X, and the executive team of the Toronto Audio Engineering Society. Uh, the basic idea is that audio systems have a lot of coupling capacitors, and each one is, is meant to uh, remove the audio signals below 20 hertz or so, but it has phase distortion. And that causes a lot of waveform changes at low frequencies, and we can change that now. We, with digital audio, we can define time such that we can, have, we can use future and past information and get, make filters that will uh, avoid those things. There are some questions. For example, is low frequency phase distortion audible? Is it significant? Uh, there are some papers on that. How practical is it to remove it? Can we use analog methods to correct it? I, I actually won't answer that question. Is low frequency compensation important relative to, say, making the crossover region linear phase? And could we universally apply it? Those are some questions. Let's look at a simple high pass filter, which is a capacitor feeding a resistor. And this is a potential divider. The resistance of the capacitor, the reactance is one over J omega C. And so that the output voltage of this thing is just the resistance divided by the resistance plus the resistance equivalent plus distance the of the capacitor. We've used a, uh, a complex number here, J. Don't worry about that math. Uh, we can write it like this. And then when you multiply through by the complex conjugate, it finally can be written down in this form. So the real part is uh, omega RC squared over the denominator, and the imaginary part is omega RC over the denominator. Now, the phase. The phase of that complex number is the arc tangent of its imaginary part divided by the real part. And that's just omega RC divided by omega RC squared, or 1 over omega RC. And that's the arc tangent of the frequency at which the, the high pass filter is set divided by the frequency, or if you like, the Hertz frequency over frequency. Now, that is a nice thing. This is the phase in radians and, and the arc tangent. If this number here is fairly small, then the arc tangent is sort of a function that goes through unity. So if the frequency is higher than the set frequency of this filter, now suppose this filter is set at 15 Hertz, then all the audio frequencies are higher than 15 Hertz. So basically, the phase can be written as F over F0. And there you see some pictures of what it looks like on a, on a logarithmic scale. And I think most of you are familiar with that. Let's look at high-pass filters then. The phase of a simple high-pass filter will go to plus 90 at very low frequencies. It'll come down at 20 decibels per decade, which is uh, 60 dB per octave, if you like. And on a linear scale... It has quite a non-linear phase. The phase doesn't go anywhere near zero, and it, it is changing with frequency quite a lot. If we look at a low-pass filter, a low-pass filter tends to be flat at low frequencies. It has zero phase there, goes to minus 90 degrees, and rolls off at 60 B per octave. But its phase is linear near zero frequency. And so it tends to have no distortion of the waveform. The frequency is fairly linear up to, say, 15 hertz or so. It's not bad even to 20. So we have various types of, of low-pass filters, but basically the Butterworth is the most common, and they don't differ all that much. Oh, okay, let's, let's have a look at what happens when we, for example, have five capacitors at 15 hertz, all set in serially through different parts of the audio system, or... Compare that with 15 capacitors set at 5 hertz. Because the capacitor's phase was, was given by its frequency, F sub 0 divided by F, then those two should be about the same. And you can see they are. 
The five capacitors have a phase which is increasing as the frequency goes to lower frequencies, and it'll be asymptotic to 450, which is five times 90 degrees. The 15 capacitors will be rising, and it'll go up to 1,350 degrees ultimately. But look in the region of audio here, the phase is the same. You look at it later when you look at my presentation. The total phase is just the sum of all the fre frequencies where they're set divided by the frequency. At this point, what I've done is I've taken a loudspeaker box with two orders of high pass. It's a sealed box, it's set at 30 hertz, 10 capacitors at 15 hertz. And this is the actual phase of that situation. So what happens is the, the 1 over F reduction, you see, is very close to being the same as that actual thing. So again, we, we have a situation where the phase is, is really determined by, I guess, all of those capacitors. Here's a typical example of a schematic, and you've got your own. In fact, it's probably wise to look at one. The phono preamp here has two, two coupling capacitors in it, but, but let's just look at the other inputs here. Those inputs, there is one at the input, there's one at the output. That one sits in a feedback loop, so its frequency is actually quite low because of the feedback, but it's still there. It still gives some phase shift. There is one at the input to the power amp, and the power amp has feedback resistor with an electrolytic capacitor sitting in the uh, emitter of that transistor. That gives another shelving unit. The thing is a uh, unity gain at very low frequencies, but it's a shelving high pass going from 30 down to one, and that has phase shift. The loudspeaker box is going to have lots of phase shift too. Here's a, here's a typical audio chain. Let's, let's have a good look at what we've got. The microphone has a, uh, a high-pass acoustic phase shift uh, of one, one equivalent capacitor. The coupling to the FET is another one. Then there's DC offset at the output of the microphone preamp connected to the second preamp. This is the preamp with gain. This, this, this preamp is just the one handling the microphone's electronics, if you like. And there's two of them in there, probably. The sound card's going to have about two. And then you can store it digitally. Heaven knows what the studio is going to do, right? It, it, it's going to have all kinds of things. And when you play it, when you get home and play it, it's going to go through your DAC. That's got a couple of uh, capacitors in it. And the audio preamp is going to have two, maybe even more. Fancy preamps can have even more. Power amp, I've only given one. Maybe there's two. But the loudspeaker has between two, if it's a sealed box, or four, if it's a vented box, right? So we, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, let, let's look at the microphone for a moment. This is a typical research microphone of rule and care. And there's this plate here with holes in it, which changes the damping. And there's a diaphragm in front of it and this coupling grid. Th this grid is actually important. It actually uh, helps the response in the right way because of the resonance. But, but anyway, th th the microphone needs to be vented at the back. It can be vented through the side or to the back. They're both, so they're both similar. But that is a high-pass filter. At very low frequencies, the air, the air pressure on the outside of the diaphragm and on the inside of the diaphragm will be the same. So its output falls at very low frequencies due to that vent. Then in addition, there is that vent, but then we have a capacitor going to the FET input. So th this is what rule and care gives as the equivalent circuit of the microphone preamp. And I'm talking about the preamp that sits actually in the microphone body. And a lot of studio microphones would have that in the body as well. How do we measure the response of a microphone? Well, the way I do it, I have a, I have a KEF B110 here sitting in this box, an eight inch cubic box. The microphone is shoved in the back of this box. Uh, it's sealed with plasticine and the box is very well sealed. Here, here's an equivalent, uh, an, another, another one of the microphones that's in the box. It's a grass 40 AZ. There's a screen here, which is not in use, but it goes into a sound card. And that way you can measure the microphone. For example, here's a measurement of it. This is the acoustic pressure inside that sealed box. And you can see it has a nice flat region here, a bit of a resonance there, but it actually falls off. And this microphone is down about three dB at five Hertz, maybe four. I, I should really have taken my my Melissa and ran it at a sampling frequency, which would show the microphone falling, you know, a, a larger amount. But this was done for a different purpose, and you'll see that soon. Now we shouldn't forget the loudspeaker, right? Because the loudspeaker also is closed box, and it has a, a second order resonance or a fourth order box. The acceleration of the cone provides its acoustic output, and it should be flat above resonance. 
And if it's vented, it's even more complicated. I don't really want to talk about that. But we do have to correct the loudspeaker's phase response. And so here's the way a loudspeaker works. If you think of the coil as giving a force to this mass, which is the cone, and that's the suspension and the air in the box, then if at very low frequencies, it's going to have an amplitude that's independent of frequency. If it's damped at all, which it would be if it had a, a coil sitting in the magnet, then it will go across like this. And ultimately, at higher frequencies, resonance being, say, 30 hertz, here it would go down as 1 over frequency squared. And so the acceleration of the cone will be taking this graph and multiplying it by two factors of frequency. You'll get it like this, so that the, the uh, loudspeaker is going up as frequency squared, 40 decibels per octave, basically, and it's flat here in the region where the loudspeaker is used. And so this system here has two orders of high pass, and uh, this is what, what it would be. This is the region in which that woofer is used, and we won't talk about the tweeter in mid-range. They, they have their own things. But, but it does have these two orders that, that we need to look at in terms of the, uh, the phase. I, I thought I'd put this in, even though it's, it's not really necessary. This is the same measure of the pressure inside this little box, right? Well, okay, here is the pressure at the dust cap just outside the box. And when I take the ratio of those two pressures, you can see that that line is like frequency squared over two decades, right? It's amazing how, how nicely it shows that the acceleration of the cone is the thing that produces the output. So that's the way loudspeakers work, right? And I, I, I kind of like that. But I didn't use a loudspeaker. Well, I did, but I, I, it's better to use a headphone. Here's a headphone, a Bayer Dynamic DT990. And uh, this, this really should be flat, this region here. And then the output here will fall off as, as two orders of magnitude, two, two factors of frequency. So this, this particular headphone sort of has an open back. And it, again, will act very, very similar to two high-pass filters at the low end, causing phase distortion and will need correction. Here's what effect a high-pass filter has on a signal. So if we take a square wave, the blue here, and we put it through a 15 hertz single high pass, we get the red curve, right? And you're all familiar with that. You're all familiar with taking a low frequency square wave and trying to compensate or looking at the output of an oscilloscope when it's C coupled, right? Now, if we set the phases of that signal to zero, which is the best we can do, then we get the green curve. It's not quite the same as the square wave because we have some loss of fundamental. It's scalloped a bit for that reason. But it is a much better representation of the low frequency than the red curve. What happens if we have four cascaded 15 hertz filters? What happens is the output of that filter system will look like the red curve there. And it's, it's awful. It really doesn't look very good at all. And the zero phase one has a bit more loss of fundamental. We got 15 hertz, uh, four of them. There'll be a little bit of loss at some of these low frequencies. But again, it's very much better. So we see that, that the phase correction really does make a big difference if we can do it. How do we produce a correction filter? This is a little bit of mass, but it isn't bad. And, and you, can, you can look at it. The transfer function, we can write it as a magnitude as a function of frequency multiplied by a phase factor, okay? Now, we can, we can always take this frequency domain representation and write it in the time domain, and we get an impulse response. And that's done with Fourier transforms. And, and I don't think of the time and frequency domain as being different. They're just two aspects of, this, of the same thing, really. Now, we can construct a, a correcting filter, H of F, whose magnitude is one at all frequencies and whose phase is the negative of that signal, right? So it has magnitude of one and the phase is the opposite of that one. Okay, the corrected response then, the corrected transfer function will be the correcting filter frequency response multiplied by the frequency response of the audio system. And you see the, this exponential here will just be canceled by that one and all we'll have left is the gain of the system as a function of frequency, which is phaseless, and that's what we're shooting for. This is done in the frequency domain mentally, and we do a multiplication, which in the time domain is a convolution. And so we, we can do that in digital signal processing. This convolution convolutes this, this correcting filter 
impulse response with the impulse response of the, the uh, audio system. Now, this correcting filter often is acausal. It has a response before t equals zero. That's fine in digital audio. We can, we can define that. It doesn't matter where we set t equals zero. But it takes some skill to, to sort things out and, and get it to work. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Now, this is a loudspeaker with two high-pass corners at 30 hertz, okay? Uh, Butterworth probably here, the way I've done it. And 10 capacitors at 15 hertz. And the impulse response of that system looks like this. It goes along blue, then, then goes uh, uh, up to uh, uh, quite high to 0.98, basically unity, comes down, and then finishes oscillating like that, okay? That is the response of, of that system, including the loudspeaker. The correcting filter will be a causal, and it's the red one here. And I'll just follow it along. It has a bit higher amplitude. It, it looks like the mirror of this, but it's not quite. It's a bit larger. It comes along, and I, have, I haven't drawn the stuff that's before 50 milliseconds there. It comes along like this, goes down, then goes up again to nearly, uh, to nearly one, and back down along the red. When we correct the phase, when we do this operation of signal processing operation, and correct it, then we have the impulse response looking like the green curve. And the green curve comes along, goes down, up to unity, and back and out. And you see how much better that is. There is a little bit of a wiggle here like that. That's because there is some, some loss of fundamental, so that it's not a perfect impulse, but it's not bad. Now, you see here, this is 50 milliseconds. If we actually want that filter to be 50 milliseconds long, then it will require 2,205 coefficients. And every sample of the audio, every, every sample at 44 kilohertz will have to have that many calculations. So it, it's gonna be a, a filter that's working overtime. Here were my uh, things that I chose to, to put in as test signals so that I could listen to them on a headphone. If I take a raised cosine, and multiply it by a bow tie here, which is plus one going to minus one, zero in the middle, I end up with the green curve. And the green curve is what I wanted. It's a dipolar pulse that has a nice starting and finishing, and, and it has a spectrum. This is a hundredth of a, uh, of a second, so it has a maximum at about 100 hertz in the spectrum. And that's, a, that's the dipolar listen pulse. Here is what happens when I do these things. I'm going to talk about uh, various things. I'm going to talk about the raw pulse, which, which you've seen before. It, it's just that, that blue thing like that, right? Then we're going to talk about what the audio system does to it. That's the cyan curve. And then we're going to talk about what we sense what we sense with our ears, which is like the loudspeaker going through it as well. And then the green curve is the audio that's been corrected, which is correcting both for the high pass filters and the loudspeakers. And the black curve will be what your ear would hear from the loudspeaker having done all that. It's a little bit hard to see them all. So I've blown them up a bit here so you can see them better. But you can see here that the cyan curve, the normal audio is, is causal. It goes up there, right? Comes down and goes along and has this tail on it, right? Now, the audio that is sensed goes through a loudspeaker as well, and it's worse. So your ear thinks that the signal is this red curve like this, and that's a horrible representation of the original dipolar pulse. In fact, it even has the highest pulse here uh, on the other side of where it should be. And so the corrected audio has this precursor pulse here, and not much uh, on the output. But when we look at what we actually sense with the ear, we get the black curve, which is not bad. It has a very clean shape, but it does have a precursor and a postcursor. Okay, this is what happens when we use an asymmetric square pulse and look at it. Again, I've chosen a loudspeaker box with a 30 hertz uh, high, double high pass and 10 capacitors at 15 hertz. That may be a bit excessive, but it, it's just to show what happens. The original is the blue curve, and it is, uh, goes to a plus a half, minus one, plus a half. So its area is zero, but it is asymmetric and has, if you like, more second harmonic or even harmonic components in it, although this is not a, a, a repetitive waveform. 
the normal audio is the, the cyan curve. And it looks messy, right? And you can see some of the others as well. You can see anyway that the final corrected or sensed thing at the ear is actually the black curve, which is actually pretty good. So again, the hope is that when we get all of this right, the waveform at the ear will be very good and it should be better than not having done it. Now, how do we, how do, we do this? How do we, how do we make this FIR? Well, here is a picture of the FIR. It com comes along like this, okay? The, the red curve goes up to unity and, and back to zero. And it's, it's completely acausal. And so it has all this stuff before uh, zero. Now it keeps on going well beyond 50 milliseconds here, which is a tremendous number of coefficients. So maybe we should cut it off here at 950 coefficients. Okay, and I, I've done it there at the zero crossing. When we do that and have that, the curve now has, has zeros in front of that. So it's the digital filter only needs to be that long, right? The FIR. Then we get a small change in the response of the system. It becomes red. You lose a little bit of, of signal. At, at these uh, intermediate frequencies because of that. However, the blue curve is the original phase of the system. And it's got all this phase here. And uh, we plot it here. Once it goes past 180, we jump to minus 180 and continue, right? And we keep doing that. Actually, we should have drawn it up going this way in an unwrapped form. And you can see that if you think of it as a complex number, it's, it's going around like, like a helix. And that is uh, actually quite the reason why I called the paper unwinding coupling capacitors. This is a, a signal which is wound up, if you like, in phase. If we fully correct it, we get the red curve here, like that. If we do this edit here and just allow 950 samples, we have the green curve. And you can see that it's pretty good down to about 40 hertz, and then it falls apart. But there's not much audio down there, so we've done a pretty good job. So. So doing this sort of thing allows us to have our cake and eat it too, and we uh, can try that. And so in summary, I'm, I'm just about done. Coupling capacitors do cause very significant phase distortion, and in principle, we can correct that. And we could make wave files, and we could listen to them with and without correction. We, we'd have to measure our systems and make sure that we, we do that. Right? We can't do that in, in a talk like this. The internet won't allow anything to go through without it being mauled. We can use those wave files. We can audition them in simple comparison tests or even more strict A-B tests. And I, I, I just wish Arnie was here. I miss that man. I mean, his A-B test box would have been, would, would be ideal for doing this sort of thing. We still do that sort of thing. We still have an ABX box and occasionally we drag it out. MATLAB is a very nice uh, development, but uh, Octave is also open source. That works too. So anyone that has some mathematical knowledge can use those things and make these filters. I think we can easily do those experiments and find out whether we can actually see things of significance. I think it's hard to do it. I, I have not yet found a good example. And that's partly because maybe I haven't modeled the headphones very well, or maybe I, I should do more things. I, I don't know. Is, is it worthwhile? Can we hear the real differences? Can, can we... Uh, are these small pre-causal artifacts, are they audible? I think not. But anyway, the whole process is quite complex. But maybe if we get everything right, we'd say, aha. And so, you know, that, that's the situation. So anyway, thank you. I'm glad you were uh, patient. I'd like to thank John Vanderkoy for sharing his presentation with us today. If you're watching this live on YouTube, please know that John has offered to answer questions in the YouTube chat window. Many thanks as well to Arthur Kelm, Blair Francie, and Denis Tremblay for their contributions to this evening's broadcast. And finally, thanks to our past chair, Anthony Kazub, for taking care of the behind the scenes technical work. Thanks to everyone for joining us this evening.